right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 16th episode of podcast on D-Shot. I'm going to kind of go away from the some of the sports talk stuff and switch over to one of my other passions and bringing one of many successful Tremper music grads um, since when I was in school. And I'd like to welcome in Chris Mish Blockstorf to the program. Thanks, Chris, for joining me. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for thanks for asking for me to come on. This yeah. Is cool. All right. So my first question for you, um, kind of from a growing up side of things, um, what recordings did you have around you when you were growing up and how much did that influence you into wanting to get into a career in music? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, it was a handful of recordings. I feel like I was exposed to a lot of eclectic kind of different stuff. Um, but I actually think it's a lot more of like, uh, to speak of like what the scene was in Kenosha was actually a big deal for me. Um, I was lucky enough that like I had basically my older sibling, um, my nephew who's older than me. Uh, he was in like the punk rock scene, the DIY scene in Kenosha growing up. And he took me out to a bunch of shows when I was like a little kid. And that combined with like the good music program that like was led by Cavelli and Wheelie and all the other great teachers that were involved in KUSD um, all combined together kind of made me want to pursue it. Right. It was kind of like the seeing the DIY scene of just like kids that were in punk and ska and metal and those kind of groups. And then having like the more structured within the school program, getting private lessons, going to summer band camp and all that kind of stuff. And then the, the, I guess in terms of like recordings, like my mom was playing like native American music in the car and, uh, and then like Enya and occasionally like a lot of classical music, um, some jazz stuff, but not as much that. And then like stuff that I was getting turned on to would have been like, my godmom basically got me into like things like ACDC and the Ramones and more like kind of like the classic rock punk kind of era. And then, yeah, just like different people, I was all, my ears were always open. Right. So uh, a specific recording is hard to point out, but uh, the, everything around me, my world, as many artists and musicians, I feel like are influenced by, you're kind of influenced by everything in your, you know, immediate surroundings. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what made you pick the trombone? Oh, uh, Mr. Wheelie. I mean, straight up, that was basically it. Um, right. So Ken Wheelie, I'm sure maybe you've talked about him on the show, but a great teacher, uh, definitely like a quasi like father figure to me in a lot of ways. Um, he, uh, literally like we had those band demo things you went in and like, you could go and like try a bunch of different instruments and stuff. And I could basically only make the trombone work. Like I, I couldn't like play any other instrument. Like I tried to play, I wanted to play saxophone first. Um, and I couldn't do it. Uh, and then, you know, I, maybe I tried flute or clarinet or something. Basically I tried a bunch of other instruments and as soon as I picked up the trombone, it just worked for me. Like I could buzz mm. all those things kind of just naturally worked. Um, and yeah, so then, I actually played cello for a year before that uh, and I dropped cello to do trombone and I don't know where that decision came from. I don't know what that was all about, but yeah, there's something about the trombone that just, I guess, spoke to me. Now I think about it a lot deeper than I did then, but at the time it was really just like, Hey, I can, I can make my lips go and it makes a sound. So. <laughs> so obviously, obviously you weren't like me and like, Oh, I wanted to play trombone because my dad plays trombone no I didn't have that you know like maybe that was cello was like that my mom played cello in high school but there was not my I didn't I didn't come from like a family of musicians and my you know my um my dad passed away when I was younger so I didn't really have there was no like other than my again my nephew I can point to him he played guitar he he was like a in again the punk rock scene um and I love that stuff but in terms of yeah like no I didn't have like the lineage I know yeah with your dad being a great trombone player and stuff I didn't have that um so it was more just like yeah again like this thing worked for me so I guess I'll do this now <laughs> I I guess I'm gonna kind of did you have wheelie for one year in, in uh, uh middle school yeah yeah so I had him at Lincoln for for a year there and then we went through like two other Smedley and who's the college I, guy now he's at uh whatever Indiana J Jacobs School of Music apparently oh yeah that's great I mean he was I mean he was great man I thought both as as a teacher you know it took him a little bit to warm up to everyone but um you know you're dealing with middle schoolers so it's I mean as some I've like taught and am currently like actually teaching a, a music camp this week and it's like you know 
it can be a little tough to get through middle schoolers. So I thought, you know, he was, and he was like, I remember hearing him like just shed on the trumpet and just like, whew, that dude could really play. So I'm happy he's working there. Cause it's, I mean, that, that seems probably like, I'm sure it's a very good fit. He was a really nice guy. So I'm, I'm happy. That it's it's kind of cool to kind of see that and be like, Oh, I had him for sixth grade. You had him for what? Seventh grade. Yeah. Um, must have been. <laughs> yeah. For those who kind of are listening, um, me and Chris first met each other and was a uh i was in seventh grade you were in eighth grade it was like i was the only seventh grade trombone player in jazz band and Mm -hmm. then it was like you keith smith and what was it kevin randall (laughs) if i'm correct yeah probably that would probably be right yeah Uh, yeah what was your kind of favorite memory from those days um i know i somehow won that louis armstrong middle school award and i don't know how maybe maybe because i kind of got us a drummer one year because our drummer had, had some sort of leg injuries or whatnot. And somehow <laughs> I, I got that because of that. I don't know. I don't know if she ever knew that I went to some drummer and band and said, Hey, we need a drummer for jazz band. But yeah, I mean, I think you were, you were dedicated, right? I think that was like a big thing. Anytime you like, especially again, like having now the frame of like being like, Oh, I've, I've now worked in different public schools. And right. Like I've, I actually taught some in New York and, and I've taught in Milwaukee and in Chicago. And it's like, you work with these different populations of like students and you're just like, anytime you actually have a kid that's like, Hey, I really am into this thing. How can I be of value? <laughs> you know, like, and that you get that type of energy. It's such an exciting thing to be involved with. So I'm sure Blanchette saw that in you. And that's, I'm sure like where that came down to in terms of like memories. Um, I mean, man, just like honestly going probably, yeah, with maybe, you know, even with Smedley probably was the one that I think he he started letting us like hang out in the band room during lunch and he would just like put on records and um, it seems like such a subtle thing to do, you know, but again, like, you know, we were asking, you asked me like some records that I grew up with. I mean, that's just like one of these things that like is pretty incredible to do with young people is just be like, I, you know, I was like, no judgment. It was just basically him being like, Hey, like I listened to this jazz, you know, you maybe put on a jazz record or even like a rock record, whatever it was. He was just like playing music and it was just chill. It was like, it wasn't like, think about this critically. It was more just like him kind of sharing a part of him and a thing that he's interested in. And, and I remember like the group of people it was probably me and Keith and I'm sure Sam, maybe Sam Fitton and a few other people in there um maybe bear uh kifle i'm saying a lot of personal last names but <laughs> jake um, jake wheelie obviously yeah jake obviously yeah uh yeah so anyways like there's a lot of these people that i'm sure were in the room at the same time we are all kind of just mixing it up and to me that was like a really impact i know like i'm sure there was other music like music moments and things like that but something about that as a, as you know just like looking up to a teacher i guess that or just like having that kind of connection where all of a sudden it was less about like the in-class thing and more just about like this connection about the music was like super valuable to me um and i feel like i try to bring that into my own teaching and stuff like that as well now and just like how i think about music in general so i know one of the recordings i think i got from smedley in like sixth grade was the finale recording of susan marches or something but then i re- as i kind of tie susan into this um i remember my first conversation with Blanchett was asking her favorite Susan March and not knowing that she was a French horn player and how French horn players have like the absolute worst parts in Susan Marches. And she was just like, I don't have one. And then she tried to get me to listen to other composers and it was like Philip Glass and John Cage. And that mm-hmm. never, that never caught on. But uh, anyways, um, both of us took lessons from Ken Wheely. Um, obviously both of us had, uh, Wheelie and Cavelli in high school. Um, what did you learn most from, from both of them? Oh, I mean, again, like with Mr. Wheelie, I really was like, that dude was literally like a a father figure to me. Um, (laughs) so to, to try to like simplify what things he instilled in me are, it's, it's tough. Right. Uh, I mean, he taught me not just about like musicality obviously that was like super integral to what i do today uh, and how to connect to the music emotionally and how to even convey that emotion through your own playing all those things i definitely would attribute to him um you know pushing me to kind of go in those directions but then also just like uh you know discipline and and humor and uh i mean there's so many things man like a general love, right? Uh, an unabashed love for for the thing and for a passion for this thing that some people might not, you know, like high school band 
you know, there's, I know there's like movies and things that of like romanticizing it, but you know, it's harder to find like the actual educators that are out there actually making you feel those things and actually making you feel like you're part of something that's really big. Right. Um, and I think, you know, Wheelie did a great job and so did Cavelli. I mean, like I remember playing uh, Eric Whitaker's October with Cavelli. That's like one of the moments that's still is seared into my brain <laughs> is like being at maybe it was like a competition thing or we were just performing the concert but we I remember playing October with him in the wind ensemble and he like uh we got to like this really big moment and there was like a there's a really short trombone solo there that I always really loved uh and having this moment where like we made eye contact and we got we arrived at this moment right and like this beautiful cascade comes and and then he just like had like a single tear shed down his face because he really was just like in it right he was so invested and uh again and, and Cavelli was very you know like as you know we all can talk about but it's like he, he's a super emotional guy right like he was uh he was able he wore his heart on his sleeve he was very like that's kind of who he he is as an individual and that was something I'd say I took away from him so both of them I mean Cavelli was maybe a little bit more strict but you know, it also made you like realize like this uh, kind of the seriousness. I think there was a level of like dedication, at least while I was at Trumper, you know, uh, that I think was really unique. It felt like a college level group at that time. Um, even in going to college when I was working with, you know, great musicians, a lot of those skills I retained from working with Cabelli um, and how like diligent and focused and how much he approached the group with that level of maturity was, I think, pretty amazing to get at such a young age and then again like wheelie like i said there's just it's like endless right wheelie introduced me to jazz in a way that i had never you know <laughs> i'd never had anyone do that for me uh uh who sat me down and started telling me listen to this record listen to these things um see what you think just you know regardless of what i think what do you think about it you know he took me to a conference in chicago you know like did all these things for me where i was able to like see he took me up to Lawrence to see Wycliffe Gordon, all these different things that really became, I mean, talk about like an experience that made me want to play trombone forever was going to see Wycliffe Gordon when I was like 16 and like seeing him play at Lawrence, which inevitably I went to Lawrence and worked with, you know, all these different people. And, but seeing Wycliffe there was, that was like the moment. And that was something Mr. Wheelie did for me. He like, I think he like, we took, he took me out of school that day and we went up and I was like me, Jake and bear again, I think, and maybe Chris, yeah, Swenson probably went up together and, and saw Wyclef and it just blew my mind. I mean, it just like, I'd never seen anyone on the trombone do what Wyclef could do. And I'd never seen a crowd respond <laughs> to a trombonist like that, right? This is a, a single trombone player going up there playing an improvised solo and getting a 10 minute standing ovation at the end of it. You know, like that's, to me, that's still mind blowing to this day. I'm, I rarely see, like I played in all these different contexts and I still have not seen an audience be as like raucous as going to see like Wyclef Gordon. There's like very few memories in my head that are like, yeah, they really just love that dude. <laughs> you know, like his energy and his, his personality and all that stuff. And what he's able to do on the horn is so unique and beautiful. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would say those are, those slew of things I just threw at you were all kind of combinations of uh, what made it, you know, what Wheelie and Cavelli combined kind mm. of did for me. Um, any like favorite stories about them too? Because like, I know Wheelie could go be conducting rehearsal and all of a sudden he'll be talking about maybe a funny story or him fishing or, I think the thing with Cavelli that somehow sticks in my head is somebody, if any random person went to the bathroom, he'd be like, I hope it comes out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Cavelli had jokes for days. It was great. And so did Wheelie too. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think there was something really. I remember one least... time where Nathan Dwyer like wrote Vikings suck behind Wheelie during rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. I, I, I I think I said the wheelie. Oh, you just got kind of schooled. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And like, um, I would say like if I had, I mean the, the Louis story, right. That's like thing that like was repeated to me for years. <laughs> and then like to go to Lawrence and work with Fred, who wheelie had always talked about, you know, and kind of like feel this all of a sudden this connection to like my immediate mentor and then to his mentor, and like being all of a sudden entangled in this lineage um, was super valuable. So I don't, I mean, you know, again, for the listeners, I, the Louis story is basically just like they had this 
bust of Louis Armstrong that essentially for years and years and years, uh, Fred Sturm and, and Ken Wheely basically uh, were stealing the Louis fixture from one another. Um, and uh, it was like an ongoing- I'll, I'll jump in. I'll yeah. jump in quick because you just saying them stealing it from each other seems like when we were in high school, when like Bradford would steal the hoodie and then yeah. Tremper <laughs> would go and steal whatever the, whatever Bradford's was, that, that just kind of randomly popped in my head. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And right, like, so that exchange of like, and how, you know, just uh, the idea of like, almost like creating your own myth, right? That was like a very much like felt like a, a created myth for between them, right? This exchange of like, this mythical statue of Louis Armstrong was like this big deal between them. And then like actually seeing the Louis in, in person for the first time, and just, I don't know, just like silly things like that. Um, that like all of a sudden played into my life in, in a bigger picture uh, for me. I mean, again, there's like so many things I can tie back to, to Wheelie. I guess I'll, I'll move on just because for time's sake, but it's like with Cavelli, um, something that I, I mean, other than like, again, that like performance that where he like kind of shed a tear, but uh, maybe not necessarily a funny story, but it, you know, just like there's something about just like Cavelli um, every always trying to like greet everyone at the door uh i thought that was and i've seen other teachers do things like that but it was just there was like this this moment of like one-on-one -on -one, um that i think he was really again intentional about connecting with people in that way right and uh and i thought that was really valuable and i mean these guys they re really cared about us you know like um as any good educator does and hopefully as any good person does uh you know, like I, I think that a lot of what Wheelie and Cavelli did, I mean, I can think about firsthand and also just like stuff from like friends that were going through rough times when we were in our teen, you know, teenage years, um, family stuff and, you know, different things, drugs, all, all this different stuff that was going on that was maybe a little bit more behind the scenes. And, you know, there were some times where Cavelli and Wheelie would like pull different people out of, they were just, I remember one day specifically, they like had, they just turned on a movie just so they could talk to one of my friends about like issues they were going through. Um, and that just was really, I don't know. I didn't see any other teachers doing that. Right. Like I didn't, I didn't know anyone else who was willing to do that to really just like sit, sit someone down and be like, Hey, like, we know we're going to put band on hold for the day for everyone else. So we can make sure that this, this particular student is going to be okay, or we're going to try to help them be okay. Right. And uh, again, just like the idea of like how much they actually cared and how much they really paid attention to stuff that was going on in our individual lives, even if it didn't seem like they were, you know, they were pretty cued into everything that was going on. And, and I, you know, I love that about them both. I thought they were, you know, they're just very passionate and uh, special people. So, you know, I can't thank them and think about them enough in, uh, <laughs> in my own trajectory. Um, I'm going to tell my favorite wheelie story because we were in rehearsal with uh, Red Jazz once and we were playing this tune called Blue Note Special and JC Ripley's behind, yeah. the, I mean, the trumpet section. And I think I mm -hmm. took a solo and I randomly did Beagler's Holiday as because it hit, it matched with whatever the B flat blues scale. And then we, Wheelie's like, is that Beagler's Holiday? But then the other part of this story is we went to Lawrence and I'm going to use Lawrence, the jazz stuff. And, uh, um, next question but we went to Lawrence and I we were in front of a clinician and I randomly did Beagler's Holiday as a random solo and Wheelie's off in the corner just laughing his butt off about it because he knew what I was doing <laughs> um, that'd probably be my favorite Wheelie story probably also that mm -hmm. probably Wheelie and Cavalli were probably the first teachers to actually call me by my nickname back back in those days mm. yeah, uh, yeah let's I'm gonna Go, go into this so a couple of those years at tramper wheelie would kind of take the red jazz um band if, for those who don't know we had what was it studio um then it was red and then it was blue or at some point there were four i don't remember something was, like that yeah i couldn't remember exactly what they were yeah but uh he he would take red jazz to lawrence um to go play with to do some uh like play for a cl clinician and then go for for the night concert and then we hit up the mall and wheelie would always be like d shot make sure you're with people or whatever but um how much did having wheelie as a private teacher in those in those experiences at, at lawrence um at those jazz fest things um even the wycliffe story that you have um kind of get you to go to lawrence 
I mean, it's huge, man. I, uh, <laughs> you know, like, and it's things I still think about back to today. And there's, there's definitely a time of, uh, post-grad student debt, uh, <laughs> regrets, I would say. But now that I've gotten a little bit older, I'm a little bit more past that just being like the experiences that I got from Lawrence were just out of this world, you know, and, and relationships and friendships and mentorships, all that kind of stuff uh, are just mind blowing. And it, it really wouldn't have been if, if I hadn't known Mr. Wheelie, I wouldn't have went, I don't think I wouldn't even have known, right? Like, I, I don't even know if I, I probably would have went to college. Um, but I was not on that trajectory in my mind. Um, I was very much like of the mindset, a little bit of like, I'm a musician. I can, I don't necessarily need to go to school to be a musician. Um, and obviously like there's great things that education, obviously I, now I have my master's. So, so like, obviously I kind of like flipped on that a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like, Mr. Wheeler taking me up to Lawrence numerous times, taking up the whole school up to Lawrence, right, for different things and it, working with clinicians and seeing that kind of campus life a little bit there and seeing the Jazz Weekend specials that they still have going on now that are great. Um, I mean, that was all, again, it's super integral to my own development. And I, I had the choice to go to a few different other schools in Wisconsin. And there's some times where I'm like, I wish I would have auditioned. Uh, in the New York world a little bit, um, or at least like broaden my spectrum a little bit more. But if I, you know, like you can't ever go back and things, but I think, you know, overall, I probably would have still chosen Lawrence just because of all the things it had to offer. And I, again, I can't like, there's lots of that I can unpack there, but in terms of like what I learned and again, the mentorship I gained from being at that school, I mean, working with Fred is still like one of the most profound things I've ever got to do in my life, you know, and, and, different faculty members there for sure outside of even the conservatory but just most of the conservatory was so great um and having that again like i said we're talking about lineage right uh, i'm i like the whole idea of being a part of a musical lineage and and kind of like taking these mentorships and seeing what you can do to pass that neck on to the next generation i think that's something that both mr wheelie and and cavelli and Fred Sturm all kind of instilled in me is like passing, you know, pay it forward, that whole idea. Um, and so, you know, all of them were super about that and gave me so many opportunities uh, and are still, you know, in some ways giving me opportunities to this day um, that I think, yeah, it, it all tied into me eventually deciding to go to Lawrence and, you know, just really kind of figure out what I was going to be doing, you know, and giving me a lot of opportunities to kind of like, explore within this bubble um that was lawrence because it is like a smaller campus and things like that but i was able to kind of start feeling what it was like to you know uh make my own band and and rehearse my own music and start writing my own stuff while also just having all the time to like focus and be lifted up with a lot of other really talented musicians around me and again really great mentorship so that uh, largely i mean if <laughs> almost almost entirely my mom always says like oh Yo, you were always set on going to lawrence like we took you to other schools you had you know you auditioned at other schools you got scholarships to other schools but you always were set on going to lawrence so she was like it was pretty hard to like try to change your mind at a certain point so yeah i mean it was kind of just like a, <laughs> a little bit like pounded in my brain, you know, <laughs> that I was going to go there. So what was, what was the music program over there? Like, were you just a jazz person or you kind of collect kind of collectively no, I mean, or. Yeah. So like that school, uh, you really can't go in as just a jazz person. I knew a few people who tried and some people who actually dropped out because of it. Um, because it wasn't necessarily what they were looking for. Uh, but for those who were just trying to be more well-rounded, which I think that's what the whole liberal arts education is all about, right? It's not, it's, you know, we were in the conservatory, but a lot of the education points itself is all about how are we going to make you into a better person for society? <laughs> sort of like you take these, all these different other interests that you might have and maybe dip your toes in different places. You're not necessarily, um, you know, uh, set on this very like strict path where you have to only be doing like you're doing these theory courses and then you do this and you have to do this many things it was like oh if you you have to do that stuff but you also can step aside you can take philosophy courses i took some film study courses i took some psychology courses you know like all this different stuff that i was really interested in um was yeah cool to have at my 
yeah, at, at my disposal. I guess if I'm focusing only on the conservatory side, I mean, again, like working with Fred Sturm was monumental. I mean, that dude, <laughs> like talk about like the energy and things that like Mr. Wheelie had. And I just saw, it was, again, it was seeing that lineage, right? I got to work with Mr. Wheelie. I got to work then with his mentor, with Fred, right? And just seeing the energy and the the heart and the passion that Fred had every single day, you know, and, and like, it's always crazy to me because it's, it's like he was battling, chem you know, he's battling cancer. He was on chemo very frequently throughout my time at Lawrence. And you would never know he, his energy never dipped. Uh, and it was always just like top tier, just always ready to go, always, you know, kicking our butts, like making sure we were working hard. Um, and, and yeah, outside of him, you know, it's like Nick Keelan, who was my main trombone professor there. It definitely gave me a lot of perspective about uh, balance, I would say. <laughs> I would say if there's one thing that I, I, I would really take away from Nick, there was also great stuff for trombone technique and different stuff like that as well. But he was really good about balance. He knew that I, I was really, really working extremely hard at the time, you know, putting in hours and hours and hours on the trombone. And Nick saw that and just didn't want me to get burnt out. So he gave me different, you know, ways to kind of focus and, and think about practicing different and all these different techniques and really kind of almost had like a mindfulness approach um, to some of the uh, practice sessions and exercises and just like my relationship overall with the trombone and with music. And Nick gave me that. Outside of that, there was also Jose, uh, you know, Jose Encarnacion, who came in a little bit later, who is just phenomenal was working a lot in the New York scene for a while and then came and got the job at Lawrence and was just incredible um he was another guy that's just like the passion right it was just like through the roof I mean he just shredded super hard to I mean dude knew every <laughs> just tunes in and out um could play just amazing stuff great ideas great melodies great rhythm uh and so much heart you know um yeah I mean Mark Ernest, uh, Dane Richardson, all these faculty members that I think were really, really fantastic. And then, you know, on top of that, like they got Bill Carruthers, basically my last year there and Bill. Did they, did they I mean, still have Marty Erickson over there? Yeah. And Marty, I actually didn't work with Marty too much, but it was always, I mean, it was great when I did it just, uh, we didn't because of just scheduling and stuff, it just never really worked out to work as much as I want to sometimes in my brass, like when Tets and things, Marty would come in and coach us which was sick. I mean, Marty's like one of the all time greats, uh, for sure. So it was beautiful working with him, but, um, it didn't always get to line up, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, like all those other cats were just incredible and Patty Darling, you know, I took piano lessons from Patty Darling. And, um, there's just so many people that were there that were like really influential, um, that it's hard to kind of pinpoint. I mean, obviously I worked very, very close with Fred Sturm. Uh, he was definitely like, again, an, almost like another quasi father figure for me. Uh, there's definitely a pattern in my life of identifying father figures and latching onto them, um, which uh, is maybe a topic for another time. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I know with all of them kind of, you know, coaching me and things like that, you know, I would say the one thing I will real quick, just sidebar is like, yeah, adding Bill Crothers, and I don't really get to finish that, but that dude is to me, one of the, the most genius improvisers alive uh and i don't know i don't know i i can't it just it's so lucky that lawrence has him i mean now they have tim albright on faculty and when i was going to my graduate program tim was like one of the guys i wanted to study with for my graduate program i almost went to purchase suny purchase where he was teaching at the time because i wanted to work with him because i was just like blown away with his versatile versatility on the you know virtu versatility and virtuosity on the trombone i mean he was just like the for talking about someone who can do classical and jazz and pretty much any style just like incredible uh he's kind of the dude um yeah so yeah it's it's cool to see that lawrence is still kicking butt you know like they're you know it's like the small liberal arts school in the midwest but man they got <laughs> they got some great people there that are doing some really really good work so yeah i learned a lot while i was there the program was great um what what was the kind of was this college, this college experience at, at Lawrence a little bit easier for you considering obviously you had um, Jake went there when you did and Ken was there when you did. I don't, I don't know how many other Tremper. You, you mean people. like maybe 
adjustment wise like i guess just because too, i had some people i know and then what's kind of what was kind of it's kind of interesting to kind of ask this question because I, obviously lawrence is a completely different school than whitewater and whitewater is kind of a school where it's like oh, our athletics kind of kick kick butt um and obviously we're the only school to win all three men's sports in one year but um what was kind of that campus life experience too like oh i mean it's very different man i mean like it's uh it's a small liberal arts school it wasn't like i was expecting you know it was like it was like the size of tremper right <laughs> like it was the size of our high school basically so we didn't have any of that like i mean there was definitely sports teams and stuff i wasn't involved in any of that stuff at all really uh, and there was people that were like jake i would say he was pretty involved with like intramural stuff uh doing basketball and all that kind of things um for me i was just like it was music pretty much all the time I was pretty much always in the conservatory I had jobs there you know like I worked as in the admissions department uh uh for three years basically um I worked as an RA for a year you know like so it was like my friends and then just my conservatory work uh and I was more passionate about like because I wanted to be a musician I started making bands like right so like I organized helped like organize together a brass band I was part of like a a large ensemble like metal group i had my own like jazz trio i had uh a hip-hop group that um i founded there and worked with a bunch of different musicians on and we like recorded a bunch of music together um i mean i was just like trying to play man like i had this other band that was just like basically a pop covers band um i mean it was just like can we we were setting shows at parties right it was like it was all very insular right it was all just on campus but it was very much like i was trying to play every single weekend i could i didn't really care about going and being part of like the nightlife scene as much really it was just like how quickly can i get this i have this energy for this thing i want to pursue this thing i need to have as much as experience as possible playing as quickly as possible in the type of environments that I want to be playing in. So that means like shows, right? Live shows. I want to have as much experience playing live shows as quickly as possible. And again, I was able to do that, but it still wasn't the same. Like, I, you know, I just was talking about this with, <laughs> with something else that I was just doing, but right. The big transition between like Lawrence and New York was like, Lawrence was very much a bubble, right? And it's beautiful to be in a bubble when you're like still figuring things out maybe. And arguably I we're all figuring things out for all of our lives. But um, it was definitely like helpful to kind of have this insular thing that, you know, it was pretty easy to, you know, like all my needs were just like right in my area, in my campus, right? Like I could very quickly get to gigs. I could very quickly, because my gigs were like from a 10 minute walk from wherever I was at any moment, right? Any of these things where all of a sudden when I moved out to New York, it was like, that was, I always knew I wanted to be in New York. So when I went to New York, it was very much like, I knew I wanted to be in the city, which is ultimately like why I went with NYU. And I wanted to work with Alan Ferber, um, who was the main instructor and Elliot Mason. I want to work with both those dudes and they were both at NYU. So, um, yeah, so getting out to there, it, that was very much where it all exploded, right? But I wanted to have, like, it was nice at Lawrence to have the experience of being like, oh, like, I can hit up, like, this person that I know on campus uh, to see if we could play at this party this weekend or something like that, right? To have a show. Were there were there um, any of those kind of, like, not, obviously, you were talking about parties, but, like, I don't know if playing in a bar is any, so was there any of that? We didn't do that. But, you know, like, it was like, I felt like it was like stepping stones. Like, I feel like we were so like my particular cohort and stuff like that were very into like, just trying to set up shows and do all that kind of stuff. But we weren't thinking outside of Lawrence, right? <laughs> that was that was the, the I don't want to say it's whatever it is what it is, right? But like there was we were doing that and then a few classes underneath us they they all started like trying to play in the downtown area. Um, to be also fair, it's like, I didn't really want to interact too much with a lot of people in Appleton, <laughs> which maybe is like, that's neither here nor there, but I'm sure there's like tons of lovely people in Appleton. I know there is. Um, but there was just like this whole idea of like, I don't really want to deal with that. I just want to be um, focusing around these people that I know I can trust basically in these moments. Um, yeah. And then obviously again, like when I got to New York, then it was very different because it was all of a sudden like, all right, uh, we don't play at campus. We play on the scene. We are out in 
the places like the the capital of like where jazz is and stuff like that right um so how do you play in those venues how do you get incorporated into those worlds who are the people you need to contact you you know all that kind of stuff figuring all those things out which I was happy I got a little bit of that experience at Lawrence, but that was a lot just like through me deciding I wanted to do this and having friends who who were also musicians who didn't go to Lawrence, who were just starting to pursue their own independent careers, who maybe had dropped out of school or done different things like that, um, who were just like, hey, I'm just going to go for it. I just want to be a musician and I know I want to do this, so I'm just going to just going to dedicate my life to it. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that was my path personally, but doesn't obviously there's tons of different ways to get to the result <laughs> all right so you're kind of talking about new york and i was going to kind of ask about kind of the gigs over there in the music scene but I'm, i guess i'm gonna since you're in chicago i might as well just say um what's the biggest similarities and differences from the music scene in chicago and new york and some of the gigs that you've had in both areas yeah i mean um Every city has its own culture, right? Uh, even like the smallest cities have their own vibe and their own scene. Um, it just happens to be New York is like the center, you know, like based on just like how many people are there, how many people are traveling there, the exchange. It's also like, I would say that New York is kind of built on the idea of transplants, right? The idea of people coming in and out of the city pretty regularly. Uh, and so I think there's actually a pretty, like, it's pretty open. Like, you know, like I feel like there's this, narrative you know at least growing up in the midwest in, in the 90s and stuff like like not having any idea what new york was other than like movies and tv um and what like stories i heard from other people was like oh it's like rough and tumble it's gruff like people are not the nicest like all this kind of stuff and then i got out there and it was very much like oh no like these people are just honest sometimes their honesty is not always nice but it's I like that honesty. <laughs> I like, I like the transparency that a lot of these people have. And they're willing to like, just say that's very much the East coast style is just like, I'm just going to tell it like it is um, the Midwest. We kind of have this thing like the Midwest niceness, um, right. Is like the idea of like niceness goes above all, but then people might be talking about you behind your back <laughs> where I think like New York there's oftentimes like it was just like this is how I feel and this we we're going to address this right net right now and get it out of the way um which is the thing I like I, I like that energy and not saying that there aren't people and again there's people everywhere that do that who are honest and, and do things like that but I would say the culture overall is much more like that in New York in terms of like the music scene I mean man it's it's everything right like it's every type of music every corner of that city i mean the amount of like times i was just walking around and i would either just hear a random person playing or hear like one of the best groups or you know people that like blew up and became huge but they were just playing in the subway or like different you know like all these different things that are just like when you're exposed to that every day you know and you're exposed to the hustle dude like that's the other part that's like huge like there's there's kids like kids like us in high school right there's, and I'm not saying like, I was out definitely playing shows and stuff with bands that I was in high school, right? I was in our own syndrome and you know, like there's uh, the big McGaffers and all these different groups that were like, definitely pushing through, like trying to do that. But like, again, seeing that in New York where it's like, oh yeah, there's like 15, 16 year olds who are out here just like in the subway every day, just like giving it, they're all just hustling and like learning how to make a living as a musician starting at that age. And that's like, that's also unique to New York, right? Like there are people who do that in Chicago too, but you need a bigger city in general to do that. That's like a very unique thing to those areas. Um, that is a beautiful thing about those places Like you have this crazy culture of just like, go, 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 like eat, 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 right? Like, like go, go for those things. If you're hungry for it, go for it. Um, and I, I love that part. And not saying that like Chicago has those things too, in terms of like, if I'm trying to talk about like differences, I still feel like I'm not necessarily, I feel like I actually feel more comfortable talking about like the New York, New York music scene than Chicago sometimes. Cause I think Chicago is actually, I would say a few things about Chicago is they they look after their own super super deep i think like the people that grew up in chicago and play music in chicago it's truly truly a unique and like very very connected community in a way that's like super super beautiful and super super deep and i love that aspect of it a lot i think it's a lot more based around like a diy like a do a do it yourself ethic where i think it's a lot of people who are just like making things happen regardless of finances regardless of uh you know 
city layout, anything you can do. It's like, they're just trying to make things happen. And there's some of that, that I'm like, that was almost some of that I was looking for in New York, right? This idea of like the loft spaces with all the artists hanging out and like very much that like beatnik kind of idea that I had in my head of like, you know, Bob Dylan and, and like, you know, even like miles and stuff like that, all these people like hanging out and, and New York still has that, but there's also like this idea of like, essentially because it's become so expensive and so gentrified um, that a lot of that art scene has been kind of pushed out uh, onto the fringes a little bit. And there's definitely people still out there doing amazing things. I mean, it's still, it's not, and I don't think it'll ever lose like the art community that it has. Um, But in terms of like, again, if I'm going to bring back to like Chicago, Chicago has this very like cool underground, really unique because there isn't necessarily that financial pressure sometimes that exists with like New York, um, just because it's a cheaper city to live in. And because I don't know what, what it all is, maybe because there's just more ability to uh, experiment. There's just more room to experiment, right? Um, that I think Chicago has created. I mean, like International Anthem, that jazz label, I think is one of the most important labels in the country, um, if not the world. Uh, Like, honestly, I I think they're doing things with the musicians and the people they have on the roster that are pretty unparalleled across the board. And there are places, you know, like there's different places. Again, I don't want to like disparage every community. I think it's like great and doing really powerful things. But if I had to like point out the, the key differences, I would say like the DIY ethos of like kind of holding your own up um, in Chicago is like super prevalent. And again, like the idea of like, you gotta, you know, you gotta figure out a way to get integrated into the scene here. And you gotta pay respects to the people who are involved in this scene because this is its own unique thing um, versus like New York, which again, because the culture is very much like based off of transplants, based on it off of like immigration, in a lot of ways, there's a more fluidity of like people coming in and out. Uh, and so with that comes a little bit more of a, uh, broader spectrum of, of people kind of like randomly calling you for a gig, right? Like I would randomly get called for a gig super last minute and they would be like, Hey, can you like sub in for this really dope thing that I'm doing? Um, and then I might never get called again, or I might now become the new person for that band. Right. It just like, you never know. And it's also like, you kind of have to just be like, well, no hard feelings. Like there's a billion amazing musicians in the city. (laughs) Like if I didn't make the call for this band because it stopped working for our schedules or whatever it might be, that's all good. Where I think Chicago, there's a little bit more like, um, just like bred in loyalty in terms of like people wanting to continue to work with the same people over and over and over again, because they, you know, and like, again, that it does exist in New York, but I think there is a little bit more, uh, fluidity in terms of like, yeah, the community there. So, and I might be talking, again, I I don't want to talk out of turn in any way. Uh, both these places are amazing. (laughs) Like, I I think they both have such great value and I learned so much and I'm continue to learn so much in both these spaces that, you know, I, I can't ever knock either one really. You really, you really threw a retro name at me by saying the big McGaffers because I remember my brother being in that group. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if that was when they started that, or I remember him having like a solo ensemble experience where somebody, like one of the judges, was like, "You should try to play it like Big McGaffers," and then my brother's like, "I actually was in that group." Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, and there, I mean that you know, like again, tying back all the way to like Kenosha. I mean, like that was that's where it all started for me, like more than even the band programs were super important stuff like that, but just like seeing again, like teenagers hosting shows that like kicked ass, dude, <laughs> they were super good. Um, sorry if we can't cuss, but, uh, but yeah, so like, right. Just like having all these bands that were super dope, um, really good music. I mean, there were, we were like, I felt, I still think of a lot of the musicians that I, the age group I was in with people at Trepper and stuff, I'm just like, man, there was so many that they're still out there doing music. Right. Like I know a lot of people from that class and that again, cohort, like that are still out here, like killing it either in Chicago or New York or, or, you know, all over the country, really some in LA, some in, you know, like just kind of all over or just doing it on their own. Right. Just like out there hustling um, as an independent musician. So it's just pretty cool to see. Which ones do you still kind of keep in touch with? Obviously, Jake Wheely, Chris Swenson, you're going to hunt yeah. out forever, but. Yeah, I mean, me and Jake pretty regularly. Uh, outside of that, I mean, like people that are here, like Dustin, um, you know, 
I keep in touch with Dustin. I guess there's like a lot of people from Lawrence that I think about uh, in terms of like that bracket. I mean, John Storino, we, we talk from not, not too often, but like, you know, when he was deciding to move out to New York, uh, you know, I tried to help as best I could to kind of get him set up. Um, obviously he's like incredible and had plenty of friends up there already. So it wasn't like, he just, I think wanted to pick my brain a little bit since we kind of come from similar backgrounds. Um, who else would be in the, I'm sure there's, I feel bad putting me, you know, put me on the spot. I'm not sure if I can think anyone else of Eric Shore. Um, I know he was in, I think in Nashville, uh, maybe, I don't know exactly where he was, but you know, different people that, you know, some I've kept in touch with some, I haven't, you know, very peripherally have, uh, kept an eye on over time. Um, but yeah, I know it just like was a really talented bunch of people. So it's, it was cool to be involved in that, you know. Obviously, I was going to try to throw in how fire like the jazz bands that my brother was in all, all those years too. Yeah, definitely, dude. I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a special time. I felt like there was, we hit that window that I know there's every once in a while, it's like, you just get, again, like I can tap back into like my, my personal experience teaching. It's just like, you just all of a sudden, you just have kids in certain age groups or something like that, there's just like all of a sudden a bracket of kids that just like have this uninhibited creative energy, right? That they're just like, I don't know. It's just, there's something happens that all of a sudden things click for these specific groups. And you're really lucky if you're part of something like that. And, you know, I feel like it's, I don't know. I, I count my blessings for that kind of stuff. Definitely. And I feel all the way through my life, honestly, you know, it's like every educational experience or just like, even you now I was talking to my mom the other day and I was like, I don't know why this, you know, like sometimes like the music career can be, it has, it has its ups and downs, right? Like it's, it's not the easiest lifestyle. Um, but it's like, I, you know, I keep on thinking it's like, well, for some reason, like these people who are super talented, uh, keep on including me, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. keep on having, reaching out to me and letting me be involved in things and, and asking for my advice or me to play music for, with them or whatever it might be. Right. And I, again, I, I, that's just, I just feel blessed. Right. Like just that people are willing to do that. Um, yeah. Any good, like, I, I know I didn't hit on this, any good band of the black watch memories. Oh, uh, man. Um, yeah off the top of my head i can't really think of anything i mean there was just like fun man i don't know it was like just hanging out with all your buddies like making music sweating a lot <laughs> out in the hot sun right doing marching band and stuff but um you know uh i mean going oh i mean this is like not even musical but we went to florida right for those trips um to play at disneyland uh and I remember that'd be remember Disney time, World. D Disney World, sorry. Yeah. Uh and you know, like we got what me and like a few other, you know, I'm sure it was like, yeah, I know the, the group of friends I was hanging out with, but we wound up being in line and we wound up getting like fast passes. Just like a, one of the Disney World people came up and they're like, Hey, you all are lucky. You're the 20th people in line today. Here's fast passes for your whole group. So then the whole rest of the day, we were able to like skip all the lines and just go on like every single ride. And that was really dope. <laughs> that was like the best, like, because I didn't go, I went to Disney World maybe once when I was like a little kid, but didn't remember it at all. So then the going back there as a teenager and then like having that experience with just like, again, like playing, uh, playing some music and then just like linking up with the homies and, and just kind of a, uh, yeah, going around was super fun. Uh, that was a super fun trip. Yeah. Any any memories from like I, I know you got I, I know I missed out on this one because I, I randomly chose the CYO thing for one year and then then did Black Watch, but you guys went to New York one year. Oh, honestly, I barely remember that trip. I'm <laughs> I remember I had really stinky feet. <laughs> I had like horribly. I don't know what was going on, man, but I, <laughs> I had, I had like horribly stinky feet. So I wound up like going with a few people to like, go get like sandals at like an Armani exchange or some shit like that. Like, uh, <laughs> and I got sandals and I went to like a ritzy, like fancy hotel. And I sat in the hotel and they had like, instead of like paper towels, they had like actual like linen towels that you could use. And I sat <laughs> on the counter just like wiping my feet down with like a one of these nice towels and soap 
And I mean, that's not, that was just like a, that memory sticks out to me, but that was dumb <laughs> and, and, and hilarious all at the same time. I remember we would like did like the NBC studios and stuff, all this stuff that like, you know, like is interesting now, like looking back to it and thinking about my time in New York and being like, oh yeah, like it was cool to like visit as young, like younger age and then like go back and actually live there and become kind of like integrated into the city and stuff. But yeah, that stinky feet story, man. That's the best one I got. <laughs> um, as we're talking about New York, uh, did I ever hear a story or something on social media that um, you went and saw Jimmy Fallon or um, one of the late night hosts and then you were talking to one of the musicians from yeah. one of his groups? Yeah, yeah. So I went and saw Jimmy Fallon with a friend, I have a couple friends, and um, I was just geeking out because, like, you know, the Roots are the the house band for Jimmy Fallon, and I'm big fan of the Roots, but specifically, like, I think Quest Love is like one of the most like prolific producer drummer, uh, just like musical pedagogy encyclopedia in his brain you know just he's like the dude right <laughs> like he just like has crazy infinite knowledge about styles and and genres and i don't know he's just a he's a genius and um yeah so like at the end of the show like my friend re like shouted she was like yo like my friend's a musician like he loves you <laughs> and so he like just stopped he like walked up to me and he was like oh what's up man like you what do you play i was like oh, i play trombone and he's like, and then she was like, yo, tell him you've got a gig tonight. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm playing. And I couldn't even remember. I think I was playing at like, oh, I don't even remember. Three's Brewing, I think it was called. I think it's still there. It's a little spot in Gowanus in Brooklyn. Um, but I was playing there, I think at a gig. And, but I couldn't even remember. I was like, so like, it was definitely one of those like kind of starstruck moments where I was just like, I can't believe this dude's talking to me. Right. And he was just like, so chill. Right. I mean, I'm, you know, and like, I think that's, again, like that's the approach when you meet people who are like not full of themselves, who are just dedicated to their craft. It's like, it's awesome. <laughs> I feel like I've been blessed to have a few of those experiences where I've gotten to meet some, you know, some really heavy hitters, uh, you know, and, and just quest love. Yeah. That was, that was a great random exchange, but yeah, I literally just stood there and like, I was like, ah, oh, I can't remember the name, man. Quest love hates me now, <laughs> but no, he was super chill. He was just like a super friendly dude. It was like a literally like a two minute exchange, but it, you know, it's like things like that. It's like, damn, that meant so much to me, even though it was such a quick thing, but yeah, that was, that was a goofy time. All right. I got to get to my last two questions. Um, favorite, yeah. favorite jazz artist, specifically trombonist. And then, then I'll, and then for this, part of this question i'll just say what's your go-to trombone solo either from a jazz or jazz chart or yeah um man favorite trombonist is is tough uh i mean marshall jilks was like the dude for me for a long time uh i still i you know i got to hang i actually lived it was so wild uh i i love marshall jilks i like when Maria Schneider's band was coming to Lawrence, I like reached out to Marshall Jilks and I like set up a lesson and, and got like a masterclass set up for the rest of the trombone studio. Cause I was just like, yo, this dude is the best trombone player alive. <laughs> and, um, and so I got a lesson with him and worked with him a bunch and learned a ton just from that lesson. And then when I moved out to New York, I, I started like just running into him at shows. Cause he was like part of the scene. Right. So um, I would just run into him and we found out that we both, I lived in the same room in the same apartment as he first lived in when he first moved to New York. We, Cause he like randomly was like, wait, you live, you live there. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, is the landlord still John Heatherman? And I was like, yeah, dude. And he's like, he's like, Oh, that dude sucks. I'm like, yeah, dude, he's awful. <laughs> he's a total slumlord. But it was just like this crazy, like, but you mean my favorite, I, it just felt like this faded moment where I was like, Oh, there's definitely like good trombone, juju in this space right now <laughs> like marshall jokes used to live here and like apparently like him and alan and tim albright they all used to like uh like kick it there and then play music together at this house and i was so then i started doing that with my friends who were in the new york scene we used to have like trombone barbecues and just invite a bunch of people over and we play bach corral whoever we'd all just print out a bunch of music and like oh, it's just like play through a bunch of stuff oh man so marshall is a huge one for me um Alan, obviously, I mean, like I said, Alan was a big reason why I even wanted to go to NYU and, and spend time there. Uh, and Alan will actually be one of the people that I would say for like one of my favorite solos. One of my favorite solos of all time is uh, 
is going to be Alan on the tune. Is it Microscopic Horses? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think so. Um, off the record, Blood Orange, Microscopic Horses. That that particular. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, Todd Sickafoos Group album, Blood Orange. Uh, Alan Solo on that. It's not complex. It's not, you know, flashy or anything. It's just melody and perfect. Every note is the best note. <laughs> and um, yeah, I would say like that's he's got to be one of my top of all time. Uh, and and I mean, there's other obviously like JJ and. I don't know. There's so many people, man, that are just like incredible. I was really into John Allred for a period of time. Wycliffe, I was like obsessed with for a period of time. Elliot Mason does things that I don't know how any trombone player would ever do them. And I got to see him do it in person. And I still have no idea. That's like one of the things that I always say. It's like, it's like awesome to like work with him, but it's like, I don't even, it's like he doesn't even know how he's able to do things that he's doing. So it's like, how are you going to tell me how to do them? <laughs> because he's just like you know he's just he plays like a saxophone player right like he can or pianist even he can just do whatever but it's so anyways i don't i is that is that kind of like is that kind of like uh you know bill watchers and fourth floor walk up when yeah he... but man like and bill watchers is great and I, I was never like a huge bill watchers guy actually the big difference is like i always got really i didn't like the idea of like uh I, the way my brain works, I need to be, I, I, I have to like know that I'm able to do what I'm going to do, I guess, if that makes sense. I don't, there's something that Nick used to always say is he would call it like the BS factor. And you say like a, a way the trombones get away with like doing things like bill watchers and stuff is there was like a level of like, essentially like going against the grain, right? All these different techniques um, where you're basically using like partials and you're using these things to kind of like give the illusion of playing a certain way, right? Even Carl Fontana, you could say, is another guy who is basically like that. And that's why I think I always love Marshall's playing so much was because Marshall was very much every, every note was exactly the note, right? Like every, it wasn't, there was no question. It was the same thing as like Coltrane, right? Like there was, there's never a question about what that dude was going for or what he was playing where I feel like sometimes with like Bill Watrous and, and even, even though those dudes are like, let, and I love Carl Fontana, like no, no hate at all. And Bill, Bill Watrous is incredible. I could, I probably will never achieve what he's done, you know, in the way he plays, but um, there's just something again, like that, that, that specificness and that very intentional placement of things. I really I, I like that in my playing and in, in everyone's up to their own thing. Right. Like that, but it's just, for me, that's a very specific thing. So with Elliot, like, again, I actually think he's doing, he isn't BSing at all. I just think he's a total freak. <laughs> like, like I think he's just like, I just think, and not saying like Marshall and Alan, all those dudes are crazy virtuosic. Like all these people are literally like the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of people that are able to do what they could do. Um, so, and they're all special and great in their own way, but it's just like, there's just something about when you hear someone play the way that Elliot does that you're just like, I don't know, man, I don't know how to even explain what you just did. So let's just keep listening. <laughs> I guess maybe I'll figure it out at some point, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I guess that's my feeling. So yeah, I would say Marshall and Alan, and then I would go with again Alan solo on microscopic sources is a uh, is just totally amazing. There's I mean there's yeah there's so many great solos out. I mean JJ to me, uh, you know is I go back and listen to all these things with JJ and I'm just like that dude. He was the first dude to make me think about like trombone as a just like soloing as a composition as opposed to like you know improvisation 100 percent right. Um, which I think is like the best technique, right? You're trying to add to the music, right? That's so you should be thinking about it as a composer a lot of times, I think. So anyways, but the other, yeah. the other weird one would be slide Hampton, because wasn't he the one to play the trombone, like flip, like from the left on the yeah, opposite he, he side. Did the opposite side. Yeah. And slide Hampton's great too. He's another one. It's like, you know, like I would, there's a few cats that like just kind of, for some reason were out of my, and I listened to like the, you know, that Slide Hampton plus how many of the trombone players that like world of trombone record. And that was great. And like some of his work, you know, throughout the ages, you know, like, 
I don't know. I feel like the people that like really, I mean, like the stuff that started really like hitting me, especially now it's like, man, there's that, that uh, Billy holiday record that it's, it's Irby green and JJ Johnson are the two trombone players on it. And just like, Oh my God, man. It's just like every solo is so perfect. And so ne- it feels so necessary in the music and the orchestration. And I just love Billie Holiday so much, man. Like she's like, to me, like the, I think she, she's my top like jazz singer of all time. I, I think, I think she changed the style of singing forever uh, and um yeah so i i could go on and but like i feel like you know a lot of people that she kept around in her immediate circle people that she worked with right they all were so crazy expressive and as i get older i'm way less interested in virtuosity and way more interested in people that make me feel something that isn't just like wow that's really impressive um and i feel like that i think it's lady in satin i, I believe it's the record but uh with Irby Green and JJ, but man, every, the orchestration, the, the solos, like all of it is just like, it's just rips your heart out, man. It's all so beautiful. It's like amazing. Every single track is just, uh, just a, a masterclass in, in writing and I don't know, expression. So do you, yeah, do you have, like, do you have any like classical stuff that you really enjoy playing or any favorite Arthur Pryor solo or man, you know, like I haven't, I don't really play too much classical unless I'm called for that has actually left my life really largely since leaving New York. I haven't really had the opportunity. So a lot of my work since moving to Chicago has very much been more focused in small group settings and also just like working with rock and hip hop people, um, much more focused on like writing horn lines, uh, doing production work. Um, that's where a lot of my stuff kind of comes into play now. I've, you know, I've gone on tour at playing like piano and trombone and trumpet with like an indie rock band. Uh, I went on tour doing like with a rapper doing trombone and stuff like that. Um, I played numerous shows with big name artists doing trombone. I've been in the studio a bunch of times doing like hip hop and rock and R and B. And, you know, so it's like a lot of my life has gone in that direction. Just uh-huh. those are the, the circles that I happen to function. I actually really miss playing classical music. You know, like I miss getting those calls. Um, and it's not, you know, I could just put that in my practice regimen. It isn't <laughs> like it's on me. Right. Um, I would say like, I really like the T-bone concerto, right. That's a, that's a good one. I actually really, I loved, I fell in love with like trying to take cello music and just learning on trombone that that has been kind of a passion of mine as of late i would say um if there is like classical music that i'm playing a lot of it's bach you know like kind of going back to the basics i mean playing bach cello sonatas and things like that on trombone is extremely hard um and very rewarding so that's something that i do pretty often still uh in terms of like trombone pieces i you know it's like weird i just sometimes think that like trombone people that write for trombone they try to write it too trombone or something you know like i like i don't want to hear certain things i want to hear beautiful like i think trombone is a beautiful beautiful instrument and it should be more written like it is cello right so much cello pieces that you hear yes they're like virtuosic but like that isn't a lot of time that isn't like the point it's more about like what is the the what are you conveying with this instrument what are emotions are you trying to say right now with, with trombone sometimes the people that write for it, it's just like hey look i wrote like a fast thing for trombone like isn't that cool? <laughs> like I made it so you can just play all these like notes in like fifth and sixth and seventh position, like cool. And it's just like, I don't know that stuff. It's not that musical to me and it just doesn't hit me in the same way. And I just, again, as I get older, I'm just like, I just need everything to make me feel something. Um, and there are lots of things that do that, right? Music is all around us uh, as much of a cliche as that sounds, but it it's true. Right. And so yeah so i mean yeah in terms of a uh, rep that i'm playing that's yeah that's the kind of stuff i'm focusing on right now would be like bach <laughs> okay um this last question how has music changed on your side of things with kind of this this pandemic that we've been in the last year yeah man so like tons of life changes obviously for everyone um i've seen a lot of friends like switch over to like doing youtube seminars and youtube stuff in general streaming um 
I haven't really been doing very much of that. I've actually just taken a lot of time to just like get back in touch with like myself. <laughs> um, I've been very privileged in order to do that. You know, like I've had to take a lot of different odd jobs to like try to keep the dream alive. Uh, I'm happily teaching again, um, which has been very rewarding. I'm teaching Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. Um, and that's been great. I get commissions here and there, right? I've written a flute piece. I've written a big band piece. Uh, throughout this whole pandemic thing, uh, I've done tons of horn lines. I've released a few different beat tapes, right? I make beats and produce for different artists. So I release a few different beat tape projects. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like whatever can make it work, man. I've done, I did a mix. I mixed a friend's project, mixed a master friend's project, uh, did edits on someone else's project. So it's just like, the thing that's kept me alive a lot through this is, uh, has definitely just been, uh, diversity in options, like, right. Always trying to diversify my skills. And I'm always respect, I respect so greatly, like the people that are able to, you know, uh, just fluidly move between things because they need to, right. Um, I think that's a lot of what comes with being an artist and being musicians, like adapting. So I think a lot of us, fortunately, were kind of set up for this transition, uh, on some level, obviously, there's a lot of touring money, a lot of playing money, gig money that was completely wiped out. That's a huge bummer. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, my case as well. But it, it's just like, you just kind of got to go with it. And I've, I've taken this year to really just reflect and just be overall thankful for the, everything I have and grateful for the people I have in my life and the opportunities I've been given. And then two, just like, I've been writing a lot of music. And so it's really just like taking all the things I've been writing now and trying to find what things move me and build upon those. Cause I really want to release an actual, I've never released a physical record. I really love to release a vinyl um, within the next, probably won't, it might be this year, probably not. That's going to be too close, but probably next year. I hope to like have a full project uh, finished up and ready to go. So yeah, that'll be, another big undertaking but that's a lot of that has come from the processing and reflection that has come about from being inside for <laughs> for a year now and uh having a lot of my musical um opportunities kind of just having to change into you know different things virtually you're, ta you're talking about like making your own vinyl and recording um when when it comes to that sort of thing like would you ever get like people if it be like a mix of people like maybe get jake wheelie involved in it or chris chris swenson um yeah so i mean i would probably use people that are you know like because my music community has expanded so greatly right um and there are people that are really i've worked with you know like i released i've released several projects now um and i had a big i had a big band in, in new york that was well it was like a big little big band and i played with a lot of other people's big bands and small groups and stuff and and I still keep in touch with a lot of those people in Chicago. I've worked with, like I said, a lot of indie scene people and, and hip hop scene. Um, so we'd probably be pulling from, I feel like my very first project was very much trying to, it was, I, it was me being young and just being like, these are all things I'm interested in. I wanted to combine the idea of like having like a non-net, like traditional jazz non-net and like a wind uh, quintet combined. So it was kind of an interesting orchestration um so it was like those two things and then it was just like here are all these thoughts and feelings and things i'm working through um which i think turned out great and i'm really happy with it still to this day but i would like to make a little bit more like mature process or uh, project in terms of you know um not necessarily being limited to only like these 10 musicians probably yeah reaching across maybe reaching out to yeah, different people in my past and stuff but you know i i hope to have you know, features from rappers on there, uh, even if they're just doing poetry or spoken word and, and probably going to do some singing myself, some that's going to be a little more exploratory, improvisational, and some that's going to be more like finite. Um, yeah, so I'm still kind of like unpacking these ideas. I haven't found the exact sound that I'm looking for, uh, but I'm hoping that eventually <laughs> I'll have that. And then once I have, because I have the concept in mind, I know exactly the content that I want to create. I just don't know what it's going to sound exactly like yet. So I have a few projects in the works, um, but the big one is still kind of like hovering above me, still kind of percolating a little bit, trying to figure out what that's going to be. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. Um, Chris, thanks for joining me. And um, thanks for listening to this episode of Podcast on D-Shot.
Thanks, everybody.